Good morning. Uh, my name is Sendore Mani, and I'm a professor in the Department of Translation and Molecular Pathology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Today, I'm going to talk to you about targeting EMT and cancer stem cells, and I'll be there yet. Um, before I begin my talk, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to speak at this AACR 2021 meeting. Thank you. Here are the disclosure. Um, think. So this slide shows the importance of studying metastasis. So in other words, um, when a patient presents with primarily a localized disease uh, due to uh, current advancement in the treatment option, um, they tend to live longer. Um, relative to patients who are um, who are presented with a metastasis or who develop metastasis, they tend to live shorter independent of uh, the, the type of cancer. Therefore, again, it's imp uh, important for us to understand the biology of cancer metastasis and find a way to diagnose and treat uh, better. When you think about a, a, a cancer metastasis, it's a quite a complex process where you have a primary tumor growing at a given organ. Um, once they reach a particular size, uh, they, they become uh, hypoxic and they get uh, become highly vascularized or angiogenic. Under, that scenario, under this scenario, some tumor cells uh, leave the primary site and enter into the vasculature through a process called intravasation. Um, they travel, migrate, and when they reach a distant site, they extravasate and they create a micrometastasis. Uh, these micrometastasis could remain dormant for many years, and at some point, they grow uh, and develop to become a metastasis. Um, these metastases can see the additional metastasis, and therefore, um, um, in general, metastasis considered to be um, um, lethal um, to the cancer patients. Studies from many groups, including ours, have shown that this program called epithelial to mesenchymal transition play a role uh, in promoting metastasis. For example, if you look at a normal tissue, the cells are organized very well and they are attached with one another through various cell cell adhesion molecules. But when these cells get transformed, they still continue to express the cell cell adhesion molecules, but they lose polarity. Um, so in order for these cells to migrate or leave the primary site, they need to break the cell cell adhesion and the cell matrix interaction. As a result, these cells become more mesenchymal, migratory and invasive. Now they can develop, they can migrate to different sites and develop metastasis. And this process is called epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Uh, in short, it's called EMT. This EMT process play a vital role during embryo development. For example, the mesoderm is generated from the epiblast through this EMT process. Um, this mesoderm can give rise to some of the epithelial organ, such as kidney and ovary, through a reversible process called a mesenchymal to epithelial transition, and that uh, uh, play a key role. The EMT program also play a role in wound healing as well as in organ fibrosis in adult. So many years ago, I hypothesized that during EMT, cancer cells not only become um, mesenchymal and migratory, but also become stem cells. The reason uh, was that when a pathologist look at a tumor in a particular organ, such as in this case in a lung, uh, just by looking at a histopathology of the tumor, they could predict whether that tumor is coming from a breast or a prostate or a lung, spleen, colon, etc. In other words, tumor cells leaving the primary site, they not only um, become migratory and invasive, but also carry the information where they come from to the distant site and they recreate organ, in this case tumor, similar to where they come from. Therefore, my hypothesis was that this EMT program also provides stem cell future so that they could develop metastasis or develop tumor similar to the site of origin. In fact, that turns out to be true. This finding published in 2008 has made a huge impact, um, which is evidenced by this more than 8,000 citations. 
it is not only proven to be true in breast cancer but also in other cancers but this brings us to the most important problem that how to target cancer stem cells and why do we need to target cancer stem cells we know from the literature uh, from the studies from many groups that the cancer stem cells are responsible for tumor relapse metastasis and chemo resistance uh, we also know that um, conventional treatment uh, they tend to target mostly differentiated cells in this cartoon it is shown the pink cells are, uh, are shown as the differentiated cancer cells and the stem cells are shown in yellow and what you see is that when you give a conventional treatment they tend to eliminate differentiated cancer cells but the cancer stem cells uh, don't get targeted and they can proliferate and differentiate gives right can give rise to a tumor um, which could be a tumor relapse or, or, or metastasis. But if you have a cancer stem cell specific therapy that would eliminate cancer stem cells. But if you remember the slide which I've shown earlier that the differentiated cells can undergo EMT and de-differentiate, proliferate and that can give rise to tumor relapse as well. Therefore, the ideal scenario would be combining cancer stem cell specific agent with the differentiated cancer cell specific agent and then you could eliminate the tumor. So we have been focusing on this idea because EMT can um, generate cancer stem cells. We have been aiming to target EMT program to target cancer stem cells. So uh, Brad Hollier, uh, when he was a postdoc in my lab, um, he was examining or trying to identify a downstream signaling um, downstream of multiple EMT inducing pathways. For this, he took human memory epithelial cells, expressed them uh, overexpressed a snail or a twist or a goose card or a TJ beta one. And then as expected in all this scenario, the epithelial cells lost the expression of E caragrin. They all gained the expression of bimentin. Um, surprisingly, they all also uh, expressed higher amount of FOXY2, the transcription factor um, um, involved in embryo development, particularly the mesoderm formation. So because of uh, its uh, expression in various cell model, uh, various EMT model, he hypothesized that this FOXY2 uh, may be a critical player in regulating EMT and stem cell properties. Therefore, he generated SHRNA to FOXY2 and expressed them in various cell model and observed that expressing FOXY2 SHRNA even uh, is able to reverse the expression of E-caragrin in some instance. And here is the SUM159 SUM breast cancer cells. When you express SHRNA to FOXY2, they even lose their invasive capability as evidenced by this immunofluorescent staining. He also performed a spear assay. Um, spear assay is a kind of an assay we use to assess the stem cell properties. Um, in spear assay, you plate cells in suspension culture. Most of the differentiated cells will die in, in suspension culture, but the stem cells will proliferate, differentiate, and create a colony. You could count the number of colonies. When he subjected snail cells, for example, in this assay, spear assay, they formed so many number of spear. When you block the expression of FOXY2 using SHRNA, that spear formation capacity is reduced. That's the case with the twist cells, the TJ1 exposed cells. That's also the case when the cells are spontaneously become uh, mesenchymal and stem-like. Even under that instance, if you inhibit FOXY2, they lose the spear forming capability. <clears throat> so, this finding suggested that FOXY2 is central to the EMT program uh, but and the stem cell program. But we cannot use the SHRNA to target stem cells in a cancer patients. Therefore, another postdoc of, my, uh, of mine, Steve Verden, who is a, a teacher right now, um, he um, looked for potential sites, uh, phosphorylation sites on FOXY2, and he found um, P38 MAP kinase had a, a, has a conserved phosphorylation site um, in FOXY2. So therefore, he looked at PASPO P38 and FOXY2, and he found that whenever you see higher amount of FOXY2, the cells also had higher amount of PASPO P38. And therefore, he hypothesized that targeting P38 may uh, uh, inhibit FOXY2 expression. With that idea, 
he exposed cells expressing FOXE2 with the P38 inhibitor and found that um, the FOXE2 protein level came down when he exposed them to P38 inhibitor in multiple cancer models, including the ones in which the cells have become mesenchymal and stem-like spontaneously. Um, most importantly, um, he took uh, this P38 inhibitor and treated mice having 41 tumor model. The 41 tumor cell line were capable of developing a tumor in a syngenic uh, wild type uh, mouse background in the mammary fat pad, and they can develop metastasis to the lung from the mammary fat pad. So he treated mice having 41 tumor in the mammary fat pad and measured the primary tumor growth. And he observed there is no difference in the primary tumor growth between vehicle treated and a P38 inhibitor treated group. And this is evidenced by this growth kinetics. And also here is a picture of tumors harvested at week five, the vehicle group on the top and the P38 inhibitor group in the bottom. So he also look, uh, he looked at the metastasis in these mice. And as kind of we predicted that in the control group, almost every mouse had a metastasis in the lung as evidenced by luminescence and the P38 inhibitor exposed to group, uh, there was no metastasis or significantly reduced metastasis, suggesting that the P38 inhibitor could play a key role in inhibiting metastasis um, and also inhibiting stem cell properties. We are in the process of um, testing and developing this molecule further for this purpose, uh, for treating metastasis. Since we know FOXE2 is a key player, we also collaborated with the Dr. Peter Schulz and Dr. Luke Layerson and Dr. Mike Belong from Scripps Research Institute uh, from California. Um, and uh, uh, Mike, uh, Mika Pitiela from my group collaborated, worked with them and, and screened for compounds uh, which could inhibit FOXE2. What they found um, is that by screening 50,000 compounds, there's one compound called Phi-1 had a significant uh, toxicity uh, towards cells expressing FOXE2. Interestingly, uh, when you expose these cells to Phi1, within 24 hours, they switched from mesenchymal morphology to more an epithelial-like morphology. In addition, they uh, become multinucleated over a period of time. When Mike Belong did a pull down using Phi1, he found um, phosphorylated form of Wymantin um, um, specifically interacting with uh, Phi1. Therefore, he hypothesized that this phosphomimetin may play a role, and he made a, a mutant, a phosphomimetic mutant of vimentin. And when he expressed this phosphomimetic vimentin in, uh, in mammary epithelial cells, they become multinucleated and they also uh, die. So we are again in the process of developing this molecule further. So there's another study. Um, um, so a, a while ago, uh, we demonstrated that if you take cells undergone an EMT by overexpressing twist or snail, they can differentiate into osteoblast, uh, uh, chondrocytes, and adipocytes, very similar to bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells, um, um, suggesting that, that this program uh, play a key role in trans difference uh, in, 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 its, in stemness. Uh, there was a nice paper from Dr. Gerard Christopher um, showing that gain fat, lose metastasis. Um, so converting invasive breast cancer cells into adipocytes and inhibit cancer metastasis. In this case, they were able to induce differentiation of breast cancer cells or breast cancer stem cells into adipocytes. And then through that, they were able to inhibit metastasis. So there are many groups trying to utilize various approach to target cancer stem cells uh, to inhibit metastasis. Um, I'm just going to switch gear here to kind of understand the biology of EMT a bit more. Um, uh, Professor Jing Yang, who's a, uh, uh, she's at uh, UCSD. Um, Jing Yang and I, we worked together when she was a postdoc uh, in the Weinberg lab to understand the role of twist and poxy 2 uh, in metastasis. Um, here in this study, Jing Yang and her, her group, uh, they tested the role of EMT um, using this DMBA TPA induced skin cancer model. What they found is that here the twist is an inducible from under an inducible promoter. 
So they generate a tumor by exposing the mice to DMBA, TPA, and when they when they uh, expose these mice with uh, doxycycline orally, uh, what they found um, is that um, the the docs will keep the twist on um, independent of where the tumor cells are, where the cells are, then they call it as an irreversible EMT. So they also had another group of mice in which um, they exposed docs um, topically to the site where the tumor is. So what will happen in this case, the tumor will get an, uh, exposed to twist, will undergo EMT, but once they le uh, leave the site uh, where the tumor is, there is no more docs, they have to revert back. So they call it as a reversible EMT. Using this model, they were able to demonstrate that the cells undergone this reversible EMT or the topical dogs tend to have more metastasis related to the mice which had a oral dog, suggesting that the reversible EMT is key um, for metastasis rather than stable activation of EMT. Um, uh, Jeff Rosen from Baylor College of Medicine and Jenny Chang, um, they were looking at tumor cells, the residual tumor cells after treatment, and they found that a number of tumor cells had um, these both epithelial and mesenchymal markers co-expressing, suggesting that um, these chemoresistant cells may be undergone a partial EMT or going towards the EMT program, and they tend to be resistant. This is another study by Shamala Maheshwaran and uh, Dean Haber. Uh, they were looking at circulating tumor cells by doing um, RNA in situ hybridization. And they found that the number of CTCs uh, in the blood having hybrid phenotype, in other words, expressing markers of both epithelial and mesenchymal um, are present in very high frequency, and they tend to correlate with the clinical outcome. So, um, Herb 11, who's a National Academy member when he was at uh, Rice University, um, along with Ishel Ben Jacob, who's uh, no more, um, and uh, jo Mohit, Mohit Jolly, uh, together, they have been researching the contribution of this hybrid uh, EM cells um, for uh, its fit uh, to uh, develop metastasis through a mathematical, uh, physical, biophysical modeling. And they found that the hybrid EM cells do have a higher tendency to develop uh, metastasis than the cells undergone a complete um, mesenchymal transition or epithelial cells. Um, in fact, uh, you know, uh, this, this cartoon shows if a cell undergo a uh, complete transition, probably they, they can tend to be more um, uh, chemo resistant, they could be part of fibrosis, but in order for the cells to revert back to epithelial, um, the hybrid EM cells will be more fit. Um, so we, uh, again, uh, when I was a postdoc, uh, I worked with Wen Jin Guo uh, to see whether we could induce a, a stable EMT. Uh, we know that the EMT induces stem cell properties. With that, we could also uh, make uh, stem cells. We know it makes them to become a stem cells. But um, so in this assay, um, this is a mouse memory, uh, uh, memory gland reconstitution assay where this is a mouse memory gland and this is a nipple and the duct is growing into the memory fat pad. This is, a, uh, this is a, at the time of puberty. It's a virgin gland and this is during lactation and you could see the entire uh, fat pad filled with lactating um, alveoli. This is a cartoon. This is a real uh, image uh, from the memory gland. Now, what one could do is take this three-week-old mouse memory gland and you can remove the ductal tree surgically. Now, the remaining fat pad serves as a, a growth factor-rich platform where one could inject cells and then assess whether they have a stem cells. So what Benjamin Go and I did was taking cells, mouse memory epithelial cells, primary cells, inducing them to undergo EMT and then injecting them to the memory fat pad. Um, so unfortunately, um, stably inducing mesenchymal transition um, did display um, mesenchymal marker expression, but because we are locking them in a mesenchymal and a stem cell state, and we are not allowing them to differentiate back into epithelial or differentiated cells, that did not lead into any reconstitution. Um, rather, uh, when Jin Guo continued and he demonstrated that if you can take a differentiated memory epithelial cell, 
and you can expose them to slug and SOX9 transiently. And now those cells can um, reconstitute the memory fat pad. So here is a 10,000 cells injected into the memory fat pad, which are control cells. But even with the 100 cells exposed to slug and SOX9 transiently and undergone an EMT, uh, they are able to reconstitute the memory fat pad, suggesting that reversible activation of the EMT is key for regenerating the tissue and also in metastasis. So, so the EMT program is a spectrum where the cells can continue to go through this mesenchymal transition, but at some point they have a reversibility, but there's at some point, there's a point of no return where the cells, they still have a mesenchymal and stem cell properties, but they are locked as a stem cell. As a result, they cannot differentiate and give rise to other organ, but in order to generate um, differentiated tissue, it's important that the cells have to revert back um, before they enter into point of no return. So we looked at uh, presence of these hybrid cells by single cell RNA-seq. And here you could see that epithelial cells shown in red, mesenchymal shown in blue, and uh, the hybrid cells are shown in green. And uh, the keratin, keratin 5 shows these are all epithelial cells. And if you look at a Claudin 7 and S100A4, they tend to be highly expressed in epithelial cells, also in hybrid cells. If you look at a fibronectin 1, uh, which tend to be expressed in a mesenchymal cells and also in a hybrid cells, suggesting that um, the hybrid cells, Claudin 7, fibronectin, TPM1, and A4 are all in, present in hybrid cells, but they are not unique to hybrid cells. So in order to understand the signaling cascade during EMT, um, we collaborated with uh, Dr. Herbie Levin, who is a National Academy member, also a professor at uh, Northeastern University, and Kunal Roy from MD Anderson, and we performed a single cell RNAC. And what we found is that when a cell undergo EMT, they slowly transition to mesenchymal, and uh, we performed this again RNA-seq, and we found that the one of the top most process which happens during this uh, uh, treatment is an EMT and uh, also the cells uh, switch from oxidative phosphorylation to uh, uh, go down when the cell undergo EMT. So Suhas so Vasekar, when he was in my lab, um, he uh, performed the pseudo time clustering of these single cell RNA-seq and he created the pseudo time um, um, signatures. And uh, when you look at this heat map, which is shown in the right, that pseudo time clustering is looking at a microRNAs, and the number of microRNAs are present uh, in the early phase and they go down in the later phase. And if you look at uh, their microRNA and their target, it's beautifully, the microRNAs are high in this case, for example, 217. When the microRNA goes down, the microRNA targets EZH2 and SMAT7 is high. So this, that's true for many other microRNAs. And they also looked at um, EMT associated signaling pathways and found that number of EMT associated signaling pathways are turned on during this um, um, pseudo time. And uh, Dr. Herbie Levin, uh, Mohit and others, they used this uh, information and performed a, a mathematical modeling and found that the notch signaling um, and, uh, and the actas uh, are a key player in regulating this um, this EMT cascade. So we also generated an EMT ohm, um, a, a, a database um, where uh, people can uh, query a gene of interest involved in EMT, um, which is developed by Suhas Vasekar. And this website is called emtom.org. And this paper is published in British Journal of Cancer. Um, if anyone is interested in exploring a given gene involved in EMT, and uh, uh, its interaction with immune cells and various other markers, um, one could use this uh, portal. So finally, I just wanted to kind of um, show a story on the contribution of immune cells uh, to metastasis, um, particularly the CD8 T cells. Uh, this, is, uh, this work is done in uh, collaboration with the wonderful colleagues and friends um, and who are shown here and led by uh, Rubia Josa. 
So we know that tumor microenvironment changes over a period of time. In the beginning of tumor growth, the tumor microenvironment tend to be tumor killing immune microenvironment. But later on, uh, tumor microenvironment switches to become immune suppressive, tumor promotive immune microenvironment. Now, how this interact with cells undergoing EMT and then regulate metastasis is the question. So what Rubia Joseph asked is that if you take 67 NR and 41, both are isogenic um, cell line they're coming from a single primary tumor, and then but they are they are capable of growing tumor in a syngenic wild type background, which means you can put them in a wild type mice, um, uh, in this case, Balpsy, and they will develop a tumor even in the presence of immune cells. Um, so here is a primary tumor. There is no difference in primary tumor growth between 67 NR and 41. But if you look for metastasis, only 41 um, is metastatic, but not 67 NR. The question is why? Both are isogenic, but one is metastatic and another one is not. Um, so therefore, um, she asked, are there any difference in their behavior? So when she took these two cells, put them in a suspension culture, what she learned we said both are capable of growing equally in the suspension culture. In other words, um, the suspension culture is almost like an injecting cells into the uh, into the circulation of the mice, um, uh, where the cells have to find a way to survive and then develop a colony in the lung. So since these two cells were uh, equally efficient in surviving the suspension, she hypothesized that if she put these cells into the tailwind of mice, both would be able to develop metastasis. In fact, that was true when she introduced 67 NR and 41 into the mammary, into the tail vein, and 67 NR was able to develop metastasis in the lung. So this suggested to us that there is something in the primary tumor microenvironment is kind of stopping the 67 NR cells from leaving the primary site and entering into the circulation. In order to investigate uh, the contribution of immune cells in this process, uh, Rubia took not skid mice, but again in the same bulb C background, and then she introduced 67 NR and 41 to the mammary fat part of these mice. It's important to know that not skid mice don't have T cells, B cells, and NK cells. And what she found is that 67 NR is able to develop metastasis even from the mouse mammary gland or the, or the mouse breast to the lung and as evidenced by uh, luminescence seen in the lungs. So this suggested to us that it's the T cells or B cells or NK cells is what is regulating the metastasis of these cells to the lung from the memory fat pad. To narrow these cell type further, uh, Rubia took bulb C mice uh, in a, or nude mice in a bulb C background and she injected 67 NR and 41 cells and she found that the tumor grew equally between the two cell model. And if you look for a metastasis, even 67 NR was equally metastatic compared to 41. Therefore, she, hypo she, she hypothesized that it's a T cells which is regulating metastasis. In order to narrow down the cell type, she conducted um, site of analysis um, in which um, for that she took uh, 67 NR and 41 cells um, grown or 41 tumors grown in a wild type mice. And when she performed a site of analysis, she found that CD3, CD8, and CD4 T cells were low and 41 uh, uh, tumors compared to um, 67 NR, suggesting that uh, either CD8 or CD4 is what is regulating the metastasis of um, or inhibiting the metastasis of 67 NR. Uh, in the wild type scenario. To test this further, um, we collaborated with uh, Dr. Sean Zhang from Baylor College of Medicine. Um, he generated both CD4 knockout and CD8 knockout mice in the bulb C background. Um, when Rubia injected 67 NR into the CD4 knockout mice, it did grow tumor similar to the wild type mice, but there was no metastasis to the lung suggesting that it is not the CD4 T cells which is regulating the metastasis of uh, 67 NR to the lungs. Then she took CD8 knockout mice when she introduced the 67 NR in the CD8 knockout, the tumor grew bigger. Um, and then when you allow the tumor of same size between the wild type and the CD8 knockout group, uh, the CD8 knockout um, mice had significantly higher amount of metastasis 
uh, from the mammary fat pad to the lung suggesting that it is a CD8 T cells which is regulating the metastasis of these tumor cells. To explore this further or to identify a potential chemokine or cytokine involved in this process, Rubia uh, performed a, a growth factor uh, profiling where she took 67 NR and 41 grown uh, in a petri dish or 67 NR and 41 grown in a wild type mice or grown in a nude mice and she performed a growth factor uh, profiling and she found um, or she hypothesized that um, a cytokine which is expressed in, in the metastatic scenario but not in a non-metastatic scenario could be of interest. In other words, a cytokine which is not expressed in 67NR or 41 grown in a petri dish or in a 67NR grown in a wild type mice but 67NR grown in nude mice or 41 grown in a wild type or nude mice and that's the kind of cytokine we were looking for. And there's one fit into that criteria, which is CXCL4. So she went ahead and checked whether CXCL4 is expressed um, um, by these tumors. For that, she performed um, ELISA and she found that cell lines 67 NR and 41 don't express CXCL4, um, whether they're grown in a petri dish or if you isolate them from a mouse, uh, 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 from a, a tumor bearing mice. Um, if you isolate CD45 popular, uh, fraction from the 67NR and 41 tumors in a wild type mice, they also don't express CXCL4. It's been known in the literature that CXCL4 uh, is expressed in platelets and she found that, uh, uh, um, that uh, platelets had a higher amount of CXCL4. So therefore, she hypothesized that um, you know, there could be an inverse correlation between platelets and CD8 T cells. And uh, in collaboration with Dr. Fei Yang, Dr. Vistuba, and Dr. Um, um, Sahin, uh, they performed an immunohistochemistry chemistry for CD8 T cells and CD61 and found that in 67 NR tumors in a grown in a wild type, um, they have a higher amount of CD8 T cells but low CD61. But in a 41, they have a low CD8 T cells and higher amount of platelets, which is shown in the graph. Um, they also validated this finding in a human tumor tissue obtained from a patient uh, using a tissue microarray. Again, there is an inverse correlation between CD8 T cells and CD61, which is shown in a graph. And in fact, patients with the CD8 low and CD61 high tend to do poorly related to uh, CD8 high and CD61 low patients. Um, so in summary, uh, for this part, that CD8 T cells inhibit tumor uh, metastasis and platelets potentially promote metastasis. High CD8 T cells and low platelets will be no metastatic potentially and low CD8 and high platelets will tend to have more metastasis. So to test this further, um, she or to examine it's a CXCL4 which is playing a role. She injected 67 NR into the VALPC wild type mice, mammary fat pad, and exposed them to CXCL4 protein or peptide uh, purchased from a company. And she found that just by treating mice with the CXCL4 peptide, she was able to promote metastasis even in the presence of CD8 T cells. She also tested. Um, because the CXCL4 is produced by platelets, she took a 41 tumor model and that she blocked the function of uh, platelets using anti-GP1 uh, uh, antibody, uh, uh, antibody. And she found that blocking platelet function also inhibited uh, metastasis um, in 41. Um, it's been known that CXCL4 works through CXCR3, therefore she also used CXCR3 inhibitor and found that CXCR3 inhibitor is also able to inhibit metastasis without affecting primary tumor growth in wild type mice uh, in 41 tumor. But still, this doesn't tell us how CXCL4 regulates metastasis even in the presence of CD8 T cells. Um, for that, we went back to the CYTOF analysis and noticed that uh, whenever there is a, a reduced number of CD8 T cells, they tend to have a higher amount of MDSE. Therefore, we hypothesize that it could be MDSE. In fact, it's quite a lot of literature which shows MDSE is a critical player in regulating metastasis. So to test this, um, we Rubia um, exposed 41 uh, tumor-bearing mice with the anti-Li6G 
um, to block MDSE. In fact, you, uh, in her hand, she's able to see um, reduction in metastasis without inhibiting primary tumor growth. Um, in collaboration with Dr. Navin Varadarajan and Melissa uh, from University of Houston, um, we did a single cell um, um, T cell killing assay. In this case, the CD8 T cells are labeled in with blue, the tumor cells are labeled with red, and the cells dying will be uh, green. And what you notice in the left side panel is that the T cells isolated from 67NR tumor in, uh, interacting with the tumor cells, in this case, 67NR and inducing cell death. But if you look at the right side panel, these are T cells isolated from 41 tumor. The T cells come and interact with the tumor cells, but it's unable to kill the tumor cells even after multiple attempt. And um, this data is quantified here. The T cells isolated from 67 NR is able to kill the tumor cells, but not the T cells isolated from 41. In addition, the T cells by itself undergo massive cell death uh, if you isolate T cells from S41, but not from 67 NR. Therefore, we hypothesized that the T cells are potentially undergoing some kind of an exhaustion um, um, quicker uh, in, a, in a metastatic scenario. So it's been known that MDSC can induce exhaustion. So therefore, it, to test that, what Rubia did, or Ruby asked, is that can CXCL4 and platelets induce MDSC formation? Um, similar to GMCSF, which has been known to induce MDSE from monocytes. As we hypothesized that both CXCL4 and platelets were able to convert monocytes uh, or, uh, into MDSE um, in this case. Um, and then it's very important to test the functionality of this MDSE. Uh, for that, we performed a CFSC assay where the cells are labeled with the T cells are labeled with a particular dye. The T cells proliferate, they will lose the dye. Uh, if they don't proliferate, they will retain the dye. So when you co incubate T cells with this MDSC generated by this method, um, and if you look at a control T cells, they proliferate and they all lost the dye um, over a period of time. But if you look at the uh, MDSC and the T cell uh, co culture, um, generated by platelets, and you see majority of them um, are sitting with a higher amount of uh, dye. Um, so is CXCL4 exposed um, MDSCs. Um, the GMCSF also had a, um, a significant amount of MDSCs uh, or T cells stuck in the with the dye. Since again, the um, MDSCs can induce some kind of an exhaustion or on, on T cells. Uh, Ruby also tested whether the T cells have in any exhaustion marker um, following this experiment. And she found that TIM3 is high um, when you do this co culture um, in presence of CXL4 induced MDSC or platelets induced EM, um, MDSC or GMCSF induced MDSC, also PT1. So Suhas Vasekar uh, looked at um, um, uh, presence of uh, MDACs and platelets uh, across various cancers. And he found that the, the correlation between MDAC and platelets were significantly high or positive um, um, in various tumors. And the CD8 uh, T cells and MDACs are negatively correlated across various cancers, um, which is expected. Um, but this is another interesting finding was that CD8 T cells and platelets uh, also negatively correlated across various cancers. And the presence of these also predicted poor clinical outcome. In summary, this finding suggested that um, CD8 T cells, high CD8 T cells, the low platelets, um, there um, leads to uh, no or low metastasis. But if you have a higher amount of platelets, that would convert monocytes into MDSC, uh, to inhibit CD8 T cells induce exhaustion and results in metastasis. So the question I asked earlier is targeting EMT and cancer stem cells, are we there yet? So I just want to give you the complexity of the problem what we are dealing with. The EMT has a spectrum, an epithelial cell to all the way to mesenchymal cells. And there's multiple stage. stage. And uh, in a tumor microenvironment, you have an endothelial cell, myofibroblast, fibroblast, neuron, myoepithelial cell, and many other cell types. And in addition, you also have a number of immune cells in the tumor microenvironment. They also change uh, depending on the stage of the tumor. Now, how 
this epithelial cell interacts with these various cell types or the immune cells and how the mesenchymal cell interacts with these various cell types and together how they regulate metastasis is the key so we are getting there i think uh, understanding these cells at various stages uh, with the current uh, technology i think we would be able to um, target uh, emt and cancer stem cells but still there's a long way to go so some other things we are doing in my lab is trying to identify and characterize cancer cells with partial and complete emt in tumors using single cell omics, spatial transcriptomics, and multiplex immunofluorescence. We're trying to examine how the tumor microenvironment induces EMT, and we are trying to characterize the influence of cancer cells with the EMT and stem cell properties on immune cells. So this is a summary. I think I walked through uh, the points earlier. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the people who really uh, helped uh, in our studies. Um, I didn't get a chance to go through some of the data. Um, Bob Weinberg for introducing me to the metastasis field. Uh, Jeff Rosen, um, we, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk about number of work we are working with them. Um, Dr. Vistuba, uh, Dr. Christopher Fennelly, Dr. Tripathi and Dr. Levin and, and many others which I have talked along the way. And my group, um, they are spectacular group, you know, uh, extremely helpful, collaborative. And, uh, and I also especially want to thank the funding support from the National Institute of Health, NCI, American Cancer Society, CPRIT, Metaviro, National Science Foundation, and the Bose Foundation. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to me.